where's the best find the location of like where things like the shower I walked on? I didn't want to just go about that, like say the back right of the room or to the right uh -huh. the door. Okay. See this thing right here? The first time I started teaching here, I put this thing up. I determined which way is north. That's north. So that's sort of the, the north end of the room. So you'd say there's a door in the northwest corner and there's a door in the southwest corner. Okay. The phone is in the southeast corner, roughly speaking. Um, the eye wash station is near the door in the northwest corner. The shower's in the northwest corner. First aid kit's in the northwest corner. The sharps box is on the floor in the northwest corner. Most everything's over there. On the west wall is the fire extinguisher. Okay, see, that's north. And this is west, that's east, this is south. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, um, in fact, a lot of the stuff, yeah. A lot of the stuff we talk about in here for lab safety, you can take that to heart and use it when you're out there in the real world. Um, like if you go into a restaurant nowadays, you want to be careful, know where the exits are. And um, uh, try to either get a booth or if you've got an open table, make sure there's a wall behind you so you can see everything coming. <clears throat> okay. So, um, there are a lot of things I could say about lab safety. The most important statement I can make about lab safety is be prepared. Know what you're going to do before you walk in the lab. If you have an idea of what's, uh, the procedure that you're going to use, the potential hazards that may be experienced, any special safety equipment that you're going to need, uh, uh, lab coat, gloves, which we provide, uh, eye protection. Right. Um, I always, I've always gotten from uh, prehistoric times glasses with shatterproof lenses. Um, we have um, glasses, over glasses, and uh, goggles. It might be hard to find one that's not scratched, so you may want to get a pair of your own. Uh, and then you don't have to sanitize them either. Um, safety equipment. Uh, maybe you're going to conduct an experiment that needs uh, exhaust. Use the fume hood. So if you know in advance what type of experiment you're going to do and what are the potential safety hazards, that's your best insurance policy for protecting yourself and your neighbors. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, I left out the fire blanket. Everybody know how to use a fire blanket? Okay, grab that cord and start winding yourself up in it. And then if you've got somebody to help you, which you should have, um, you'll drop to the floor, roll around, and the, the blanket is designed to smother the flames. But if you're ever out somewhere that you, you can't, right, stop, drop, and roll. Don't just run, right? What does that do? That adds more oxygen to the flame. <laughs> so you, you get on the ground and smother the flame. Uh, let's see. Think of anything else. Phone. Phone numbers. I, I'm not so sure the phone numbers that I've got are. In fact, I, oh, here they go. So I've got uh, a phone number for fire, for the poison center, and for the police. These were, at one time, these were valid. So the fire number I've got is 304-752-3601. The 
The poison center I've got is same area code, 831-1101. And the police, 792-8590. And if all else fails, <laughs> what was it? What was that movie with Tim Allen, uh, Jungle to Jungle? Remember that one? Um, it says, you know, you know how to uh, call 911? Yeah, 911. No, that was another Tim Allen movie. That was uh, Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> you know how to you know how to call 911? He says, yeah, 911. <laughs> so <laughs> that's your uh, backstop, 911. Oh, the safety data sheets. Yeah, they're in that notebook on the right back there by that wooden box, which is a barometer which doesn't work, but they're all in that, uh, hard copies are in that book, data sheets. Um, eventually, at least in Blackboard, I had them all in, in Blackboard, so you could look at them up. And uh, eventually I hope to get them in the bright space. The material's there, I just haven't uh, edited it in. And they will tell you, uh, so when you have an experiment, you look at the materials that you're going to be using and you can check the, uh, the hazards of that material in your data, safety data sheets. Uh, let's see. You ever work in a lab alone? Or at least have somebody in close proximity that knows you're in there. That can come running if you have trouble. Um, other things like uh, no open toed shoes, uh, pants cover your legs, uh, your lab coat goes down to the knee. Um, let's see. Think about what you're doing and what you would do. Say, uh, have your mind full of what ifs. You know, what if I drop this beaker? What are the hazards? I mean, other than broken glass, right? is there something in that beaker that could uh, be hazardous to other people and myself? So think about what ifs. And, and that's what you do in real life too. I mean, um, at least uh, my dad, when I was learning to drive, he would say, all right, what are you gonna do if something, if blah, blah happens? You, know, you start, eventually you start thinking about it on your own. But until you do, then that's the parent's job to uh, force you to think about it. Think about what you're going to do in emergency situations. Uh, and it's very likely that you won't be able to think of every one. I mean, just look at the uh, Apollo 13. Everybody remember that one? Remember the movie anyway? Well, I was around when, when it actually happened. I was watching it on TV. Right? Nobody predicted that that accident would happen, that they would stir the tanks and it would blow up on them. The oxygen tanks would blow up. Uh, they had planned for that contingency. So they had to do some fancy footwork to get those three guys back alive. Uh, and they did. But you'd rather think about it in advance. And, and they do that, right? These, these astronauts, these test pilots, fighter pilots, and those that are in, especially in combat situations, they're trained ahead of time. What do you do in this situation? So you're just, it's memory just kicks in and you do it because you don't have time to reason it out. And that's the same thing in laboratories. Think in advance. Um, okay. Um, so there's a whole list of these things in here to consider. This is what a safety data sheet looks like. And that's government mandated. They have to be this way. Um, right? as, as, well, you probably had first aid training to work in where you're doing. Has everybody had first aid training? No. Okay, well, we just take some basic stuff, like 
um, what if you're cut? You, you uh, clean the wounds best you can, direct pressure, stop the bleeding. Uh, tourniquets are a last resort uh, because they don't just cut off blood to the bleeding part, they cut off blood to everything else too. And you lose blood flow to a limb for too long, and <laughs> necrosis starts to set in. So tourniquets are, are a potential hazard in, their, in themselves. So direct pressure, uh, uh, you, chemical spills, you get a chemical on you. If it's, if it's in your eyes, go to the eye wash station and you rinse for how long? 20 minutes, at, at least 20 minutes. With your face in the water. And that's where your partner comes in because you may not want to keep your face in there that long. They hold your head in. <laughs> it, tough love. Um, shower. If you get covered over a significant part of your body with a chemical of some kind, um, you might have to get in the shower. Uh, be sure that the hazard is real, that you're covered in chemical before you pull that handle because it is going to drench this whole lab. The floor will be that deep in water very quickly. Um, and it has to be to, to get you cleaned off. Whatever, if you've got a uh, spill on your lab coat, which is what it's there for, strip it off. Right. Um, we don't expect you to get buck naked, but the water, you're gonna have a lot of water drenching you when that happens. And it's better to have water all over the floor than uh, a seriously uh, injured person. Uh, Let's see. And my job is to see to your safety too. So I'll, I'll be observant. Say, if you're starting to do something stupid, I'll say something. If you're just doing something different than anybody else and doesn't look particularly hazardous, I won't intervene. Um, but if an accident does happen, only if there is time do you notify me first. Otherwise, you take care of it immediately, right? Time is critical. And I'll probably see it happen, or if I don't, then you can tell me afterwards. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other question is, let's see, do I have a place in here for the lab agreement? Chemistry lab safety agreement? Yeah. You have to sign your name. Yeah, um, what I don't have in this one, and I should have, I, I have in, in a different one, is are there any uh, significant medical conditions that we need to be aware of for individuals? Right. I've had students in here like, two at a time that were pregnant, so we had to be mindful of that. And uh, uh, if you have any other uh, chronic illnesses that we need to be aware of, right? If we have some noxious fumes that are going to be generated and you have uh, lung problems, we don't want to expose you, right? So even if we would normally conduct an experiment on the bench top because the fumes are not that bad for you, they could be potentially life-threatening, right? If you, if you are an asthmatic, for instance, uh, we need to make sure that you have your rescue inhaler available and uh, I know where it is. So if, if you become incapacitated uh, for that reason, then I can get it to you. So things like that. Um, okay, um, general safety. Uh, if you're gonna bring, probably bring your backpack in with you or some other stuff, that needs to be away from the work area, right? You can put it on one of these tables, uh, chairs. We never use them for anything else. Um, don't leave them out on the floor. And uh, if we're going to be using an open flame, right, you don't want your, your uh, lab paper uh, close to it, right? <laughs> right. The, the flame is probably more than 455, 51 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the ignition point of paper, at least according to Ray Bradbury it is. 
when he wrote that uh, book, Fahrenheit 451. That's why he named it that, because that's when paper combusts. Um, so, and you need to, to keep the aisles clear. Uh, OSHA rules say that you need two foot egress. So how do you know two feet? Well, these tiles are a foot across. So, okay, that's kosher. That's more than two feet right here. So we wouldn't put anything here. We wouldn't slide a chair and slide. You need, you need two ways to get out of any location. So from here, you need to be able to go that way or that way. And for the whole lab, you need to be able to go out that door or out that door. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, eating and drinking. All right, since, since the lab space is used both for lecture and lab, we sort of, I sort of treat it as a hybrid. So if you, have, if you have a drink, which I will have, and when I do a lot of talking, my throat gets dry. So I keep my drinks up here because I don't ever do anything with this space. So my drink will sit up here. If you have a drink, put it up here. But in your work area, no eating or drinking. And if somebody comes in and tells me I'm wrong, all right, I'll change. But until then, um, I'm God with a little G. <clears throat> okay, so we have the lab safety quiz. And um, you can look at the uh, schedule, the course schedule, and it tells you in there when lab reports are due. Right? What you'll notice is lab reports are always due on the day that we go into the lab for the next activity. So that could be a, a week break, it could be two weeks break, whatever the case may be. So this one, um, since our next lab is next week, this one isn't due until next week. But oh yeah, you can turn them in early. That's not a problem. In fact, if I were in your shoes and I were done, I'd want to do that. It gets it out of my hair. I don't have to carry this stuff around. Now the instructor has to carry it around. Uh, any questions? First aid. It's behind that pole. Yeah. In fact, there are two boxes over there. Oh, the white thing. Yeah, that's paper towel dispenser with no paper towels in it. So when we need paper towels, I've got a roll of them in the in the prep room that I'll bring out. Because as an adjunct, you know, I don't know how this thing works. I know some things about how the school works, but. You know, usually if you're a full-time employee, eventually you get to know who to go to to get things done. It doesn't matter what it says on their name tag. You know who to say, uh, I need this fixed. And, and it gets done. Or if you need to know gossip, you never talk to uh, the administrators of any kind. Never. If you want to know something, don't talk to them. Talk to the secretaries or the janitor. They know everything. I guess janitors because they pick up all the trash. Secretaries, because they've got ears like the radar when everything's going on. <clears throat> two thirty-four, right? Yes, this is two thirty-four. <clears throat> and the laboratory section, we're in LO one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's only one section. Oh, is there only? Okay. Yeah, it's just us. Uh, where is it? Oh, we don't have a locker number. The locker numbers are uh, what I call buckets. They're in those big yellow cabinets back there. So I guess we could go ahead and assign them if you want, but we'd have to shoehorn uh, the other guys in when we get here. And since we don't need them right now, I'd just as soon wait a little bit and then we'll, we'll assign buckets. They have... They have stuff that you use for most laboratories, except for the next one um, from, from then on. And then extra stuff that's particular to a lab, um, I'll bring out and set out somewhere for you. The chemicals that you might need, uh, various apparatus that is not in your buckets. Um, 
So let's see. Um, a word about these faucets. They leak. So if you use a faucet, be prepared for them to leak, usually at the top. Okay. Um, so if you, if you don't need them, you're going to have to use them occasionally to right, for cleanup. Um, but I think I lost my battery. Battery's still good. Um, so we'll talk about cleanup for individual labs when we get there. Uh, benches usually have uh, a little soap, which is fine, the Dawn type soap, and uh, distilled water in the bottles. And that's all that stays out here permanently. The rest of it is in your buckets or I bring out as needed. Okay, so I didn't bring the other lab, but we can, we can talk about the, uh, the graphics today or we can talk about it next week. If you want to get started on it, maybe I better introduce it anyway. What does that one do? Uh, introducing graphing techniques. Right. How to present data in a graphical form. That's basically the, the objective of that exercise. Because when you have things like, um, let's say, we're going to do an experiment along the way with gases. Uh, and it's based upon Boyle's law. So we're going to relate the pressure of a confined gas to its volume. And you make measurements. Right? You measure the pressure, measure the volume at each instant. And then you change the pressure and measure the change in volume, and you get a set of data. Right? You'll have pressure and volume. And they'll, they'll have units of measure. We won't worry about those right now. But you have different values. Right? These are data points. Right? For this one, you have a pressure and a volume. So on the Cartesian coordinate system, you can map that as uh, pressure changes volume will change, right? So for each one of those, we have a data point with an X and a Y value, right? So we might have one uh, here. For low pressure, you'll have high volume. And then if you increase the pressure a little bit, the volume will decrease. So this is, um, this is an X, Y coordinate system. Right? You have those values, learn how to graph those. And then you get, for this particular example, you get values like that. So as the volume decreases and the pressure increases, they relate that way. And you can draw a, good, a best fit curve on those data points. Okay. Show you how to do that graph. And, and what, what other scientists would be expecting to see in your representation. Right? They need the coordinates. You need units of measure identified as whatever it happens to be, one, two, three, right? you pick the units. And then um, you have a title. What's that graph about? Right? That's the title. Um, then you have your data points. You have these, you have units of measure, right? Say this one is in uh, atmospheres. And this one is in milliliters. Mark that in there also. So all that information is required for anybody to look at your graph independent of anything, any text that surrounds it. These things have to stand alone. Right? So if you need to say something in particular about that that's not in this scenario, you would have uh, the caption information. Okay. Why do we use graphs? Because it conveys, one thing, it conveys a lot of information in a small space. And the other thing is, it um, visualizes trends. If you just have a table of data, sometimes you can't see. Uh, any relationship, any good, the, the relationship between variables. But if you put it in a graph, 
uh, humans are visual creatures. The graphs are just one way that we tap into that ability. Okay. Graphs are extremely important. In publications, we call them figures. But it's basically graphs. And they can, they can have uh, any kind of graph is possible. This is the simplest kind of Cartesian system. You can have three-dimensional representations. You can have uh, contour graphs. Right? Say if you're doing um, uh, research in, in the field somewhere and you have a contour graph of the, uh, the area that's under investigation, it may show variations in elevation and you can relate those to whatever measurements you're making. Right? They, can, they can be. And then, um, very often, you can uh, assign a formula to that best fit curve. Right? This one, the one I just showed you, was the hyperbola. Right? And, and math uh, shows us how to write hyperbolas. Of course, most scientists, chemists, physicists, whatever, um, they shy away from curves because it's, it's a little difficult to, uh, to write the formula for a curve. Whenever you can, transform your data so it'll give you a straight line. <laughs> straight lines are much easier to deal with. And most of the important equa equations in chemistry, um, while they may start out as uh, curvilinear or even exponential, eventually there's a, a, a straight line version that's used more often. Okay, any questions or you can go back in the, in the other room and actually look at the document and see if there's anything I missed. I, I tried to sort of give you a overview there. So I think I lost my other student. So let's see if I can do this. We'll take a quick look at um, next week's lab. Introducing graphing techniques. We don't have to be well, actually, the, the lab is supposed to be conducted next week. So the only reason I'm doing this is to give you a little heads up in case you want to get into it early, which is fine because it's not something that we have to do in the lab. In fact, a uh, quiet space at home will probably be a better place to do it than here. <laughs> um, but there are some definitions, right? We, uh, a graph is a method of displaying data in a visual format. Um, and for our purposes, we're going to be using the Cartesian system. So you have an X and a Y. Now, this only shows one quadrant of the XY graph. Right? The Cartesian system can have negative X's and negative Y's. But in the real world, at least in the world I come from, most of the values are going to be positives in that section. So when you draw your graph, um, look at your data. Do you have any negative numbers in there? Right? And then you might have to access the negative parts of the graph. But this is going to be your X or the uh, abscissa. I spell that right. Abscissa. And this is going to be the y or the ordinate. Okay. <clears throat> and these are quadrants come, coming from probably Latin. Quad means four. So you have four quadrants of this space. Um, this is the origin. And anything on that point right there has a Cartesian address of zero, zero. Okay. 
So when we say a plotted line goes through the origin, that's where it's headed, right there. Uh, let's see. So do I need any other definitions before I talk about how to draw a graph? Okay. All right. When you're going to actually draw a graph physically, and in fact, um, at one time, I tried um, giving, instead of this format, I used uh, Excel spreadsheet because Excel will draw a graph for you. But I found that that was, that was too much for some students because they weren't proficient in Excel in the first place. And the jump from the physically drawing the graph to the Excel was too big a leap for them. So I went back to physically drawing it. So if you can do this, then you can take advantage of technology to do it for you. Uh, okay. So, Say we have a set of data. How do we arrange our data so that it takes advantage of the space that we're allowed? Uh, you'll notice at the back of this, we have uh, graph paper. Let's see, where is it? Oh, it's not in, see, this is the key. In yours, it should have graph paper toward the back. Okay. Now, that may not be enough. Right? So you start to draw your, your graph and make a mistake, one that's unrecoverable. So you might need some more graph paper. Let me see, did I bring some more? Yeah. At the bottom. Back there it is. So I got extra graphite. Uh, the machine stays together. You think you might be, it doesn't matter. You never have too much graph paper. <clears throat> and you'll notice in that graph paper how it's laid out. Um, it's got uh, major and minor lines on it. So it's got dark lines and then the lighter lines between. Them. Notice that between each of the dark lines is uh, five uh, light lines. So that's important when you're deciding how to lay out your graph. Um, what you should do when you're drawing your graph is take advantage of all the space that's available. If you need some negative space, <clears throat> then on your paper, uh, well, first thing is orientation. How are you gonna orient your graph? I mean, in this case, are you gonna orient it uh, landscape or portrait? Right. So how do you decide? Well, it depends on which axis needs more room. If the, if the uh, X axis needs more room than the Y axis, you're gonna go landscape, lay it down. If it's the other way around, then you go portrait. So that's one thing that you need to do. Uh, second, you need to know um, what's your independent versus dependent variable. Okay, what's the difference? The independent variable is the one that as the researcher, that you control, you change. In our example in there, the pressure volume, we control the pressure and the volume of the gas responds to that change. So in that case, the independent variable is pressure and the dependent variable is volume. And by convention, the x-axis has the independent variable. Right? So in this case, it would be pressure versus volume. 
Okay. Um, all right, so now you have your axes identified. And then you also want to use all available space. Available space. In other words, you don't want to set your graph up. You've got this big sheet of paper and your graph is like here. Okay. That's a waste of space. So you, you stretch, you use as much of this as you can in both directions so that your graph will cover the paper. Okay. That way you can see more detail, right? This way, that could be anything. It could be a, a, I could have fallen asleep drawing my graph and made a big smudge and there it is. So use all available space. Then, and actually coordinating with this is uh, the scale size. Scale size and actually uh, subunit of that is divisions. Okay, so on our paper, we've got um, major divisions, major units, and minors. Okay. So you want to select your units, right? You know how far you can go. Say um, the pressure, uh, you can go up to maybe four atmospheres. So if we say four atmospheres is our maximum, then how are we going to divide the rest of it? We often go one, two, three, four. That don't be four there. So maybe that's all we can use in, in this scenario. You want to set it up so that your subdivisions are easy to read relative to the data that you have. So if you want to uh, mark off in tenths, you would make a whole unit here so you can use five and five, right? This would be a half a unit and this would be, so there are your tenths, okay? So this would be one, this will be two, this will be three, and our hopefully our paper goes out far enough for four. So now you've got the maximum units on that get that axis. Check the other axis, you know, how far do you go on by? Well, in our particular experiment, we go up to 10 milliliters is maximum. So you want maybe like that, and on that axis, you would have nine here. So it looks to me like eventually we're going to have to go to portrait, right? Because this is going to have more units required. So we flip it this way. And in that case, well, actually, it takes practice. It takes trial and error sometimes. <sighs> Let's see. Scale size divisions. And not necessarily in this order, units of measure. And that usually is decided for you by the experiment. But sometimes you can take units of measure and convert them to something else. Right? Uh, for instance, when we do this experiment, this Boyle's Law experiment, we measure the pressure with a tire gauge, right? And the tire gauge is going to give you units in what? Pounds per square inch. But we want to express it in atmospheres. So we need a conversion factor to go from PSI to atmospheres. If we plot it in PSI, that would still be a valid curve. But say your, your instructor says, no, it has to be atmospheres. And I'm God, so you have to do it my way. You know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so you need to know the conversion factor, and, the, and I'll give that to you, of course. Um, well, actually, there's a reason for converting PSI to atmospheres. Because uh, in this case, the pressure on the gas 
right? We have a have an enclosed vessel, actually a two liter bottle, and you have your syringe in here, like that, and it's capped off here. So you got your trapped gas in here, and you put pressure on it, right? And you can measure the volume. Well, what's the pressure on that gas? Well, we measure in this nipple. We measure the pressure. So this is uh, gauge pressure. Let's see, that's gauge pressure. But there's also an atmospheric pressure. Whatever the atmospheric pressure is, we have to add to it, and they have to be the same units of measure. All right. So I choose atmospheres. Um, my barometer reads off in inches of mercury. So we convert that to atmospheres. And this is in PSI, so we convert that to atmospheres and we can add them together. So that's why we chose atmospheres here. Okay, let me see if I got everything. Uh, um, I mentioned it earlier scale size. Divisions, okay. This could be also uh, major divisions and subunits. You want to pick your subunits so that you can take your data and easily plot it. That's why I like to pick, uh, have 10 marks between, so I can do tenths at least. Okay, so these are all the considerations that that you need to uh, prepare a graph. Um, now, once you get those data points plotted, sometimes it's instructive to do like I did here, draw a best fit line. Right? And how do you draw a best fit line? Well, curves are kind of difficult, but it's still the same idea. You minimize the distance between the line and the nearby points. So let's say we have one here and one here like that. They go like that. Experimental error. Right? So we draw the line so that we minimize the distance between all the lines. Straight lines are easier to do, but you can use the French curve and it helps do this. But if we uh, transform the data and produce a straight line, right, then you might have then all you need is a ruler, and you can minimize the uh, minimize the deviations. We call it. Now we're, we're getting into statistics. Somebody had statistics. You had oh good good good. So you'll recognize some of this stuff. A best fit curve is what we call that. Even though it's a straight line, it's a best fit curve. Uh, Oh, I, I left out title. You got to write the title in there. What is the title? What is this graph showing? It may just be uh, the relationship between pressure and volume of, of, an, uh, of a gas. Now, <clears throat> once you get your line drawn, let's say we have, uh, it doesn't have to be pressure and volume anymore. Let's just hypothetically say, let's just say we have a straight line. Now, um, we can express that in terms of an equation, right? Everybody remembers this one, right? Y equals mx plus b, right? X values going here, Y values are here. This is the slope of the line. This is the Y intercept. That's why we like straight lines because they're very well behaved. <clears throat> um, let's see, where was I going with this? Oh, uh, we can express the, uh, the straight line in those terms. And if you know anything about statistics, you can say, you know, how good a fit are your values? You can give an R, uh, R square value, which is the statistical term for how good is it fit to that straight line? Um, <clears throat> but if our data, 
say our lowest point is here and our highest point is there in that neighborhood, right? What do you do with all this other stuff? I mean, we say it's a y-intercept. That's where it would intercept if we had enough data points. Right? Or we can go out this way. Anything we do in here, say we have values like that, we can use that equation to solve, say we have an x value here, we want to find out what the y value is. So you put the x in your formula, calculate the y. Like that. So that's our, you don't have to measure that point either. That may not be one of the measured points. But once you have the, the line, you can calculate. Anything between these extremes is called interpolation. Um, you can still, since you have a mathematical formula, math, it, that formula doesn't care where it came from. You can plug in any value here. Say you have a value way out here, way over here. You can plug in the value and find out what would the y be, right? If it occurs in this region, we call that extrapolation. Okay. Now, in a statistical sense, how good are your numbers when you calculate things like that? The best numbers are the ones that are about in the middle here. As you get closer to the edges and way out here, then your, your variability, your um, error is magnified, it's increased. And sometimes uh, in statistical terms, a um, confidence limit will be imposed upon the graph. And you'll say within, between a confidence limit on this side and that side, between those two, you have a certain degree of confidence. Uh, a common uh, value is 95%. You're 95% confident that your value is between those two, right? Well, when we do that, um, it usually goes like this. That just shows you that way out here, <laughs> your confidence is almost nothing. Way out here, extrapolation is almost nothing. So your best values are right in here in the middle. Now, you don't have to draw those for this exercise. I'm just using that to, because I can. Um, but uh, it's a, an, uh, an expression of the value of interpolation versus extrapolation. Sometimes you do have to extrapolate. Uh, and very often uh, we use extrapolation to say, uh, what might be in this region? Do we need to design another experiment to extend our knowledge out that way? Uh, let's see. We can calculate the slope of a line. Right? What is the slope? The slope is rise over run. So what's rise? It's a change in Y. So if we go from This point to that point, how far have we gone? Well, in Y terms, we've gone here. Delta means a change. So we've changed a positive amount in Y. How about X? Well, X we changed here, this distance, okay? So the slope of that line is the change in Y over the change in X, it was a slope. There you go. Okay, that's valuable information and you're gonna need it in order to write the equation. Now you need to know also the Y-intercept. Even if it's extrapolated, you need to know it to write the equation. So how do you do the Y-intercept? Well, once you know the slope, you can put an actual value in there. And then all you need is one other point on that graph, fill in the Y value, fill in the X value, and calculate the slope, I mean the Y intercept. 
Okay, then you have your equations. Now, when you do that calculation, for the best results, you want that xy value from a point to be very close or right on that line. Right? If you use a value that's over here or over here, it's going to be off. So you pick a value. Uh, if you have a value in your data set that falls on that line, that's good. If it doesn't, then pick one that falls on the line. Just measure it. This is that one. Okay, now we can do the calculation. Let's see. Um, units of measure. Okay, let me clear some of this stuff off. There are examples in this uh, exercise. And in fact, I think they use pressure volume uh, as, yeah, in fact, uh, figure three is pressure volume, an example of um, a graph with a best fit line, all the data points. And uh, below it is the same data having been transformed so that plotting that new data gives you a straight line. So how do we do that? Well, in this case, we've got uh, pressure versus volume gives us this line. But if we take that data set where we had pressure versus volume, right, take this one and just take the reciprocal of it, then plot pressure in one over V. If you do that, then you get a straight line. Okay. Now, the question is, what are the units of measure? Well, if pressure is atmospheres, that doesn't change, right? It's still atmosphere. How about volume? If the volume was milliliters, then one over milliliters, remember when you do anything to numbers, do the same thing to the units of measure. So we take the reciprocal of the numbers, we also get the reciprocal of the units. So when you plot the reciprocal of the units, now they're gonna be milliliters to the minus one. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna save an explanation for that. It may have an explanation in here for why this works. For when we we look at gases, when we go into gases, then I'll re-explain it of why that transformation works. Um, let's see. Um, let's see some other examples, other applications. Hydration curves. I think. Not all of this is required. I think I've got a good bit of bonus in here. When you get into these other applications where you're plotting a titration curve, where you get that sigmoid curve on the figure five, where it goes like this. I left that out of the required section. You can do that if you'd like. And then there's a broken curve on figure six. Part of the curve is down here. And another part of the curve is over there. Um, let's see. And I've, I put points, I think. Do I have points in all of them? Okay, good. So that gives you an idea of what they're worth. Uh, and then we get over to, let's see, page. we got the same page number on this. That doesn't help any. There's a bonus section. Here it is. Bonus section. Bonus section includes that, that other stuff. I'm more interested in, I think, uh, pressure volume is uh, in the required section. And yeah, pressure. Oh, and volume temperature. Volume temperature is Charles Law. We'll get to that in gases. Pressure, uh, Charles Law, volume, temperature, 
Boyle's law, pressure, volume. And then those others are extra credit. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that, or if you get into it this week and we come to back to lab on the, uh, next Friday, then we can use that time to answer your questions. And maybe you can, you can end up with some extra credit. So uh, let's see, hold on a second. What are these pages? Here we go. Right, required section 78 points and bonus is 39 points. So what that means is uh, 78 points. That's the denominator, right? If you get all of the required section perfect, you've at least got 100%. But if you get any of the bonus, you, know, you can add to that, right? make it bigger, and you can get more than 100%. <laughs> And that's the way I do my exams too. If there are any bonus in the exams, they go into the points there, go into the numerator, but not the numerator, I don't mean the denominator. I know some instructors like to have so many hundred points for the whole year and you accumulate points as you go. I never did sit right with me. Doesn't give me enough flexibility. But for individual exams, if I have to make corrections in the exam due to mistakes that I've made, then that kind of screws up my total point count. So I like percentage. And then I do weighted percentage. Like for the, for instance, uh, let's see how much of the uh, exams are worth. 80% or 70%. I think it's 70%. Or yeah, 70. And lab reports are 30%. And if I did, if I did based on uh, uh, credit hours, the lectures are usually worth three hours, the labs are worth one hour. So the labs would be worth 25%, and the lecture would be worth 75%. But I find most of my students do better in the lab than they do sitting down and taking exams. So I sort of waited toward the lab a little bit. Okay. Um, that's probably all the damage I can do today. We'll, we'll hope the weather is cooperating and next week we'll come back to the same location. And I'll see if I get any afternoon students show up because we're supposed to get some snow. It's spritzing out there now, uh, but it doesn't look like it's accumulating. Yeah, yeah I got 74 miles to get home. Wait, did this do a longer numbers? Should I hold on to this whole sheet or should I turn it on the quiz on the back? Oh, um, you can leave that one empty. Yeah, the locker number is like that bucket. The buckets are numbered from one to eight, I think. Um, and I don't take inventory. Uh, if you break something, I just replace it. I know, at least when I was going to college, you had an inventory of your drawer and anything you broke, you had to buy. But that was understandable because some of the stuff we used was very expensive. But this is cheap stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm able to turn this in without having to fill it out. That's, that's signature. Uh, oh, instructor, I'll sign that. Uh, locker number, we don't have that. And just the date. Oh, I, I dated. Okay. Yeah. My side turn. Yeah, you turned it. Flip it. Okay. All righty. Thank you.